Welcome everyone to Geoscience Australia's Wednesday seminar. For those who don't know me, I'm Lisa Carson. I lead the Community Safety Branch here at Geoscience Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I would also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating in our seminar today. This morning's seminar is Flood Vulnerability Research at Geoscience Australia and the presenter is Dr Ken Dale. Ken's talk will provide an overview of flood vulnerability research in the community safety branch at Geoscience Australia. It covers work looking at the tangible and intangible costs of floods. Vulnerability models for residential, commercial and industrial buildings are described and the cost effectiveness of structural mitigation options that are evaluated in recent work undertaking in the collaboration with the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC. And the presentation highlights the utility of these research in reducing flood risks in Australian communities. A little bit about our presenter, Ken Dale is a structural geologist, a structural geologist, that's who I am, structural engineer, who obtained his bachelor and PhD degrees at Monash University. Following postdoc research in Japan, Ken joined GA in 2003. Research interests include the behaviours of struct structures and other infrastructure under extreme loads, currently blast and flood, and the collection of building data that influences vulnerability to those hazards. Ken leads GA's Flood Vulnerability and Mitigation Research Program. With that, I'll hand over to Ken. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, and welcome everyone. Thanks for coming along this morning. Uh, I hope you find the presentation interesting. I just realised I've actually got my title wrong on the very first slide, so hopefully uh, things improve a little bit from there. Uh, so just a, a quick outline. Uh, the, the work I'm presenting today is, is the culmination of almost uh, 20 years of research here at GA. Um, so there's a lot of people to acknowledge and a lot of uh, collaborations that we've been involved in over that time. Um, any mistakes and omissions will be mine and not that of the people that have actually done the work. I'll introduce uh, the Vulnerability, Resilience and Mitigation section here at GA for those of you who, who don't know who we are. Give a bit of background, so why we're actually uh, interested in flood vulnerability, why we do this research. Talk about the, the models themselves uh, and two different types in particular that we'll focus on. Uh, spend some time looking at some post-event work that we've done where we actually get out into the field following a flood event um, and what we can learn from those types of studies. Talk about a, a research program we've, we've just completed with the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC, so an eight-year program that uh, finished in June this year. Give some recent applications of the, the flood um, vulnerability and mitigation modelling and then uh, finish with some, some next steps where we'd like to go. So there's a lot more people I could probably acknowledge, but those are some of the key contributors there on the left. Uh, I've cheated a little bit where so where we did um, some survey work in southeast Queensland, particularly in 2011, we had a, a really large field uh, team out in the field. So <clears throat> I have uh, cheated. I'd like to acknowledge all their contributions and similarly for those who helped us in surveying uh, businesses in Sydney. I'd also uh, just like to draw attention to the, the image there. We've got Valdis Juskovitz and Shelby Canterford. Behind them are a whole heap of postal surveys. They, uh, they drove um, that research following uh, the, the floods in 2011. And uh, just to highlight that uh, Veldis sadly uh, passed away earlier this year. He was a, a really uh, a great team member, not just for his, um, his technical input, he's a statistician, but he was uh, just also a, a really terrific person to have uh, in the team and around the office. Uh, in terms of other collaborations, uh, there's a lot there you can see. I won't go through them, but um, it's basically all levels of government we've worked with. We've worked with private consultants, uh, in the insurance industry uh, and academic researchers as well. Uh, so uh, as I said, it, um, this work probably started in about 2004. Uh, and has been going in, in various uh, guises ever since. So that there have been a, a huge amount of contributors to it. 
Looking at the, the vulnerability, resilience and mitigation section, uh, we, we reside within the, the community safety branch. So Lisa is our, our branch head. Um, I won't go through the, the, the blurb there on the left, but you can see where we sit in, in GA's sort of research areas. We, we're clearly supporting Australia's community safety. Uh, we're a team of eight at the moment, so six engineers, including our, um, our director, Mark Edwards. Uh, we've got a GIS cartographer and a geospatial data analyst as well, and a couple of um, others who uh, were, were recently staff members are uh, our economist and statistician who've contributed a lot to, to this work. Looking at uh, background to the research, so why, we, why we're interested in flood vulnerability and being able to mitigate that or reduce it. Um, in uh, a couple of years ago, the Australian Business Roundtable for Disaster Resilience and Safer Communities uh, released a report into, um, well, in looking at looking at the impact of uh, hazards on, on our communities. And you can see there that in the, the decade from 27 to 2016, uh, flood uh, clearly had the, the largest um, annual economic cost to, to the community. This probably uh, is not real news to anyone either, but um, as you'd know, the, the IPCC recently released their uh, sixth assessment report. And if we just take a couple of little excerpts from the, the Australasia regional fact sheet, uh, we can see that heavy rainfall and river floods are projected to increase. Uh, and that's based on the, the 1.5 degree global warming. So if, if it um, actually goes ahead higher than that, then that, um, that increase is, is uh, assumed to become even worse. Again, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, just a couple of uh, little clips of, of stolen from the ABC there, but basically you, you can see that we were still being impacted by floods. So these are both events that happened uh, earlier this year uh, and, and we continue to have communities uh, and their infrastructure impacted by floods. Our, our standard um, workflow that we look at in terms of doing uh, natural hazard impact assessments is we, we start with hazard. So in this case, we've got um, water where it shouldn't be essentially, uh, so floodwaters. We have assets that are exposed to those uh, to that hazard. So it, it might be residential buildings, it could be uh, community in general, so the people, could be critical infrastructure as well. Those exposed assets and people uh, have a vulnerability to that type of hazard. Uh, so it's pretty clear that we it, buildings are, are vulnerable to flood water. And then we have a, a variety of impact metrics we can look at. So I've, I've got a big dollar sign there where we, we typically uh, like to be able to try and express uh, the impact in, in dollars. That, that means the most often to, to people uh, and policy makers. But we have a whole heap of other metrics we could look at. So the number of properties inundated, whether people are displaced from their houses or not, uh, whether there are injuries and fatalities. So that there's a, a lot of different impact metrics we can look at. Uh, the work of VRMS typically sits with the, the vulnerability and impact area. So the, the two um, shapes on the, on the right there, but we also do get involved in the exposure part as well. Looking at uh, flood vulnerability models themselves, there's two typical forms we look at. Um, the example here is, is what, what's typically known as a stage damage curve. So we've got our, our hazard on the uh, horizontal axis there. That's a, an inundation level of water above the floor of the house or the property, whatever the, the building is. And then a, a damage index on the, the vertical axis, which is the repair cost divided by the replacement cost. You can see on the image on the left there, in, in terms of flood, we usually don't have a lot of issues um, determining the hazard because there, there's usually a, a pretty dirty tide mark um, inside the property. So we, we can pretty accurately know how high the water did get above the floor. I should mention these, these curves, uh, a number of assumptions uh, are made in developing these. And, and the key one is that the water will rise uh, fairly slowly and also drop fairly slowly. So you're not getting pressure differential on the walls. Uh, you're not getting velocity related impacts to the building. It, it's basically getting wet and then empties out again. 
Uh, in terms of developing these curves, uh, and, and Martin Wainer is the driver behind just about all of these, um, we, we break the house up into between 60 and 100 different components. Uh, slowly, um, or we, we have a, a, a typical house of a particular type, break that up into 60 to 100 components, look at water levels above the floor in stepped increases, and then uh, at each of those water levels, determine what's getting wet, uh, whether that can just dry out, whether it needs to be replaced, or whether it needs uh, to just uh, some repairs. And then those become, uh, those costs become rolled up and become part of the damage index. I've called these fragility curves, but um, they could be stability curves or something else as well. But that's basically where we do try to take into account the, the velocity of the water and you're getting different type of impact. So the house is getting wet, but um, it typically gets pushed uh, off, its, off its foundations, as you can see in this case here, which was in the, the Lockyer Valley in, in 2011. So the, the chart there on the right uh, has a velocity on the horizontal axis and the depth above floor or inundation above floor on the vertical. And when you get the, the combination of those two, as you're getting further from the, the origin of that graph, uh, there is a, a more and more extreme hazard to your structure. It's not as nuanced here because we're typically talking about uh, it gets washed off or it doesn't, um, but, but it's another sort of measure that we can use in terms of flood vulnerability. This is now stepping back to the stage damage curves, uh, and these are just some examples. Uh, the next slide summarises them a bit more, but basically following the, the Queensland floods, we did some work that was funded by the then Department of Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, looking at um, a suite of Queensland, uh, Southeast Queensland uh, residential type homes uh, and developed stage damage curves for uh, almost a dozen of those, I think it was. Further work with the Department of Climate Change and Energy Efficiency and also the City of Sydney added some more residential building types. So uh, Victorian type terrace houses there but also started to look at some uh, industrial uh, type buildings. And that work was then further extended through some NEMP funding or National Emergency Management, uh, Management Project funding, uh, looking at, at light industrial and also community type buildings. And so these are all uh, had stage damage curves developed for, for those, uh, a typical building of that type. And so uh, 37 of those different models were, have been developed. Uh, you can see the different proportions there. I, I didn't mention, but there was, there was further work with the city of Sydney, um, looking at commercial usages as well. So CBD types, um, often big buildings, but, but they're not all um, type skyscraper type buildings. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Particularly for residential, we, we've got models that have been developed for, for the contents and, and how they get damaged um, when, when flood water gets into contact with them. So th those are a similar form to the stage damage curves where you've got a, a water depth above the, the floor in the house. Uh, and as that goes up, you're, you're getting more and more damage to your contents. It's much harder to quantify for businesses. Uh, where the, the contents, uh, the value of the contents for a starter can vary greatly from business to business, but also their vulnerability to, to getting wet. Moving to post event studies. Um, so the, the big one was really Brisbane and Ipswich in, in 2011, where I mentioned we, we did have quite a large team on the ground for a few weeks, um, looking at a lot of different damaged buildings. And that was followed up with, as I mentioned, by that, that postal survey that um, Beldus and Shelby were, were the drivers behind. Uh, with that one, we got 1,267 responses. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk in the next few slides about, about the type of information we can get out of those postal surveys. Brisbane Ipswich, uh, unfortunately, flooded again in 2013, but it did give us the opportunity to, to reach out to people who'd completed surveys in the first place and had said they were happy to be uh, contacted again. So it's a smaller number of respondees, but um, the percentage of, or the proportion of those who received a survey and responded was, was really high. So 61% is, is a terrific return rate for, for this type of um, uh, survey. 
Uh, Bundaberg, <coughs> excuse me, also flooded in 2013. Uh, so there was a, a smaller team uh, went up into the field there, two people for uh, about a week, uh, looking at the damaged properties. Uh, and then a postal survey also went out there to households, but also to, to businesses in this uh, instance. So that was that was something new. And that was to, to everyone, um, damaged and undamaged properties. And uh, finally, uh, in 2015, there was severe uh, flooding in Dungog in New South Wales. Uh, again, a, a two-person team went out for a few days following that uh, event. And I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about that further on. So what do we get out of these post-event studies? Well, we can get information to either validate our, our, our work that we've already done or to perhaps create uh, completely new empirical curves if we if we have enough data. So what we see here is the, the red curve there is one of our stage damage curves that we've developed analytically. Uh, all those blue points on the, the graph to the left are, are um, outcomes that we received from the postal survey. So those are of the same building type generally and people have, have responded with how much water came into their house and what it cost to repair. Uh, you can see there's a lot of scatter there and that is typical of, of post-event um, data. Uh, what we can do then is condense that down into a, a curve, which you can see on that graph on the right. Um, and it gives us a, a bit of confidence that we, we're heading in the right direction, that our, that our curves are, are not too bad. That's just one example of a particular house type. <clears throat> now, similar thing, so this is now Dungog, where we, we actually had some fairly uh, extreme behaviour with uh, houses being completely washed away. So this is, this is where a building was. Uh, we know what type of building it was and our, our very clever team were also able to do some, some real forensic work and using uh, some videos that were had been uploaded onto YouTube, were able to actually make an, an estimate of what the water velocity was uh, at that location and how much water the house was impacted by. So we're actually able to then use these uh, stability curves here on the right. Uh, it's quite a small sample size. You can see there's, there's only, um, what's that? One, two, three, four, five properties that we were, were of the particular same type uh, that we were able to, to work out the, the velocity and the, and the water depth for. Um, but again, you can make those comparisons. That that chart there is some work that was done at GA uh, very, very early on in 2004 of that same sort of form where we've got the, the velocity and also the above ground depth or above floor depth rather. And once you get outside those curves um, towards the legend there, you're, you're really looking at a very uh, hazardous sort of region where we're expecting the house to be floated off its, its foundations. And that's just the same thing there with the Smith curves. So the results are generally what we what we'd expect, um, although not not in every instance. I think that that one five there, which um, we'd say is in a low hazard um, region, uh, had really uh, spindly um, and vulnerable uh, footing, so it, it was pretty easy for it to wash sideways. Uh, aside from just the, the bricks and mortar type information in the post-event studies, we, uh, we can gather other information as well uh, that that's really informs uh, uh, the, the overall picture of, of what happens uh, to people uh, pre and post flood. So there are a lot of questions in, in the postal surveys about warnings, uh, whether people received them or not, whether they acted on them, where they received the warnings from and also their own risk perception. So were they aware that they might be at the risk of flood? Uh, did they think it had never happened there? Things like that. Questions on, on how they prepared ahead of the flood, if, if at all, and whether they had to evacuate uh, and, and how they actually were, were evacuated if, if that occurred. Again, we're also then able to look at, at financial implications of flooding beyond just the, the structural damage itself and the losses of content. So, other um, other impacts that, that are, are real and are there uh, in terms of finances. So whether they had to pay for temporary accommodation um, is one. Whether they had a loss of income and weren't able to work for a little while after the flood or weren't able to get to work potentially 
uh, and in terms of the businesses, uh, you know, what the impact was on their, their operations, their profitability on their stock um, and things like that. And also to ask about um, the physical and mental health impacts where where the physical we can we can often put a, uh, a cost a medical cost on those but mental health is is much more tricky and and we'll talk a little bit about or I will talk about the, some of those uh, intangible impacts a, a little bit later on So moving now onto the, the bushfire and natural hazard CRC research. Uh, I mentioned this, this was a, an eight year program that, that completed earlier this year. Uh, our core research was on cost effective mitigation strategies. So we were, we were trying to develop uh, an evidence base that could be used by decision makers to, to make uh, cost effective decisions on, on mitigation for, for flood prone buildings. In addition to the, the core research program, which did run for that eight years, uh, we had two what were known as utilisation projects. So one was looking at, at mitigation in, in Launceston, uh, and that was almost full town mitigation where our levy system there was upgraded. So we did some work to see uh, whether that was a, uh, a cost effective decision to, to upgrade that levy system. And we also worked with the National Flood Risk Advisory Group in uh, looking at developing some generalised flood vulnerability models. I'll talk to each of those in turn. So with the core research, uh, the first thing we did was, was look at developing a, a building classification schema. Um, I won't go through all the information there, but basically rather than looking at the house as a whole, we broke it up into components that could be uh, separately defined. Uh, and you can see that the story types, there are, there are a number of different attributes that could be used to categorise those. The next step was to review uh, the, the likely or the, the available mitigation options. Uh, this is looking at residential buildings only, uh, where we have here a, a pretty clear example of elevation. So this building was uh, is in southeast Queensland, was flooded in 2011. Uh, when we went back in 2013, you can see that it has been uh, elevated quite neat uh, and a very appropriate type of um, mitigation option for, for that particular building type. It's not appropriate for, for all types though. Uh, relocation is another fairly extreme option, I suppose, if you might consider that. Uh, we are basically moving the entire house to a, a new location, which is hopefully not, not flood prone at all. Uh, dry flood proofing is where we're actively trying to keep water out of the property. Um, that can be effective, but, but there's a number of things to consider there in that you need some warning. You're going to put that shield on. Uh, you, you, need, you need time to actually put it on before the flood arrives. And this is another type of uh, mitigation that's not appropriate for all housing types. So if, if you're keeping water out of that property, uh, it can generate some really large buoyant forces um, and, and quite easily move properties. Uh, wet flood proofing is where we assume that, that water is going to get into the property if there is a flood. Um, and so we take uh, actions to, to try and mitigate or prevent things from getting wet. Uh, so an example here is the air conditioning systems where if you were uh, wet flood proofing that property, you would have them raised. So hopefully they, they don't get um, wet in the event of a flood. Although you can see the tide mark on the wall there as well. So that was um, fairly extreme at that house level. They'd have to be raised very, very high. Uh, water's also getting into the house, obviously. So we, we're then assuming or, or then taking measures to, to use um, more flood resistant uh, materials, so uh, floor coverings that, that can be uh, cleaned up and, and kept in place following a flood rather than ones that have to be thrown out, for example. And then we can also use uh, flood barriers. So this is an example of a, a permanent flood barrier where we've got the, basically a, a wall right around that property or those properties. Um, but there are also a, a number of different proprietary options um, for temporary flood barriers. Uh, which can be placed out uh, ahead of a flood. Again, you, you need to do that before the flood arrives. And the other thing with flood barriers is that 
they're only useful uh, as long as the water doesn't actually overtop them. So once once if, if the flood is, is higher than your barrier, it, it's not actually going to achieve much. And uh, just one picture there at the end of the, the simplest type of, of flood barrier, I suppose. Uh, we did a testing program through the, the Natural Hazard, Bush Fire and Natural Hazard CRC. So this, this work was done uh, by the Cyclone Testing Station at James Cook University, where we had a, a number of different building components that were tested uh, in, in their normal state, if you like, but also after they'd been flooded or immersed in, in their immersion tank. And you can see some uh, timber I-beams there on the left, or hopefully you can. Uh, that are being uh, flooded, basically. Uh, the good news was in this instance that, that most of the uh, most of the components that were looked at uh, almost were almost at their full strength or their full capacity following uh, the, the flooding and or the wetting and then drying. Uh, the actual uh, I beams there were, were one instance where there was a loss of capacity or a reduction in capacity uh, when they're actually tested while they were wet. The next step was develop, uh, to develop costing modules for, for different mitigation options. And at that point, there was also the selection made on five uh, residential properties, uh, property types that were going to be used through the rest of the research. And you can see the five types there. We've got a, a variety of different ages and uh, building materials. Uh, so the costing modules, we, we know what we want to do to mitigate the, the houses with the, the appropriate mitigation options anyway. So we had uh, the, the work uh, that would be required uh, costed by quantity surveyors. And next after that was to develop vulnerability curves for retrofitted buildings. So we have our suite of uh, stage damage curves for, for buildings in their, their normal state or their original state. Uh, and for those five house types or property types, there was um, then new curves developed in their retrofitted state. And, and you can see in the example on the left there where we've actually, it might not be too easy to read, but the, uh, the blue curve or the higher curve is the, the building in its original state. And then the, the purple one uh, down near the bottom is after we've elevated at 2.5 metres. So as you'd expect, the um, it, it's not really sustaining any damage until the water gets up to almost that, that 2.5 metres. What appears to be less effective here are those uh, curves on the, the right where we're looking at two wet flood proofing options. Um, one where it, it, the flood proofing has been uh, just applied directly to the house and the other one is, is when you're doing a, uh, so the green one, which looks a little bit more beneficial is if you do that wet flood proofing work while a reconstruction or a renovation is, is being uh, done at the same time. So those were done for those five different building types and for all the appropriate um, retrofit options. And the final step in the, the core research in, in terms of developing that uh, evidence base was looking at actual benefit versus cost analysis. So firstly at, at aggregated building level and then at the individual building level. So in terms of the, the benefit cost analysis, um, just to quickly go through that for those who, who have probably heard the term but, but may not know how we actually do it. We assess the risk before mitigation uh, so it's looking at, at all available flood likelihoods um, and coming up with an average annualised loss, which is a, a dollar figure based on, on the outcomes for all those different likelihoods. Uh, we'll do our virtual retrofit next. So the mitigation work, we know what that costs uh, and we know how many properties we're going to apply it to. So we, we there have, then have the cost component of our benefit versus cost. Uh, we, we reassess the risk after mitigation, so using those uh, mitigated vulnerability curves and that reduction in the loss, in the uh, average annualised loss, is our benefit. So then right at the end, uh, those benefits and costs, so the, the benefits into the future have to be discounted to the present value and then we come up with a, a ratio where if it's, if it's above one, uh, the benefit is greater than the cost and that's considered to be a, a good investment decision. <laughs> 
So looking at aggregated building level, uh, we looked at the suburb of, of Invermay, which is in Launceston in Tasmania. Uh, you can see, well, where all those dots are, that, that's the suburb of Invermay. Uh, that blue outline there is the extent of the probable maximum flood in, uh, in Launceston. That assumes um, that levees aren't present. So there are actually levees in Launceston, but, but the work we've done here uh, assumes that they're not actually there. We're looking at, at residential buildings only in this instance. Uh, so there's 820 in, in that suburb. Uh, and we had to make some assumptions on mitigation uptake rates. So uh, we, we did actually look at the ideal situation where every single one of those residential buildings uh, had some form of mitigation applied to it. Uh, that's not really practical. So we then looked at, at um, those three zones where we've got the red dots, we call that a high hazard zone where the, the water is, is more than two metres uh, above floor there. The green uh, was less than a metre and the yellow is one to two metres. So we, we had different um, uh, assumptions on, on the amount of mitigation that was going on in each of those zones. Uh, went through the, the benefit cost analysis and, and found that nearly all of the uh, options that we looked at were cost effective. Uh, so a benefit cost ratio of, of greater than one. Uh, so in that green zone, the, the low hazard zone, uh, dry flood proofing was, was the exception. So that wasn't a, um, a useful or a, a beneficial um, investment option. Uh, and we also found basically that, that the temporary barriers in the high hazard zone were, ended up being the most cost effective where we, we were putting uh, barriers along the or imagine putting barriers along uh, street surfaces and actually protected uh, a lot of those buildings in the, in the red zone there. At individual building level then, um, the five building types that we looked at, or we showed the images of before, were all assessed using the appropriate mitigation options. Uh, we looked at different types of catchment behaviour uh, when we were doing the assessment. So Launceston, Brisbane and the Lower Hunter and that was to try and, uh, so, so not all catchments behave the same when they get a lot of water in them. In some, uh, the floodwaters can, uh, with rarity, can rise very, very slowly. And in others, uh, as the floods become more extreme, the, the water can rise extremely quickly. So we tried to capture some of that difference in, in the catchment behaviours. These were obviously all theoretical um, analyses. So we also looked at various floor heights, so differences, uh, distances from um, uh, the ground or from the, the flood source. For this work, uh, barriers were assumed to protect one building only. Um, and some of the key results out of this were that uh, elevation was typically the most cost effective option. Uh, so where it was a, a potential option for a building type, it was typically the most cost effective. Uh, a modern brick veneer home, so that, that's the BV there. Uh, with a slab on grade, uh, elevation is, is not uh, a, an appropriate option there. So in, in that instance, wet flood proofing was typically the, the most cost effective. Uh, the benefits that we've calculated here should also note are, are really a lower bound. So it's, it's to the building uh, and the building fabric only. So we're not looking at contents. We're not looking at any of those other you know, intangibles or, or other uh, potential tangible losses that, that really we know do occur. Um, so it, it's, it's a good thing to try and capture the, the full cost when we are doing a benefit cost analysis because it actually makes the mitigation options look, look more and more attractive. Uh, so looking now at the utilisation projects and this work was actually done, uh, the, this lawn system work was done before the lawn system work I, I just described in, in Invermay. Um, but the, the logical flow of this work uh, of the presentation is it's coming second. Um, but basically this, this was uh, a utilisation project where we were looking at reviewing the costs and benefits of upgraded levies in Launceston. Uh, and it was really timely because the, the upgrade of the levies uh, began in 2010 uh, and was normally completed in 2014. There were severe floods in Launceston in 2016. So a project was undertaken to, to look at the, the effectiveness of, of those levies and, and assess the benefit versus cost. 
Uh, and a little follow on to that work was also an opportunity to start in including some of the intangible costs that we know uh, are there, but are very, very difficult to quantify. Uh, and that was done in collaboration with the University of uh, Western Australia. So looking now community level in Launceston, we've, we've got uh, that, that same flood footprint or the flood extent, if you like, that's a probable maximum flood. Um, and we've got a much bigger exposure database here because we're not just looking at the suburb of Invermay and we're also not just looking at residential structures. So these were, these were for all the building types that we had um, vulnerability models for. Uh, so we, we, we developed the exposure database. Uh, the big part there is typically uh, defining the floor height, which is obviously important to us. Um, so a lot of work went into doing that. Uh, the flood hazard was was provided by a consultant or uh, access through a consultant. Um, so we had uh, flood layers from a one in 20 year uh, annual recover, recurrence interval right through to the, the probable maximum flood. And for this work, uh, residential and non-residential uh, losses were estimated and you can see the types of things that we, we looked at there. Uh, the basic outcome of the, the work was that uh, the, the construction of the levees uh, was um, a good investment. Uh, and, and if the levy, oh, not the construction, the upgrade of the levees rather, um, if, if the levees had have failed during the flood, so the old ones, um, the, the damage would have been, I think, approximately about four times the, the cost of the, the levy upgrade. So it, it was um, extremely timely, that, that action. Following on from that, there was there was the potential for a levy extension into another suburb that, that is not currently protected by the levy system there in Launceston, a uh, suburb of Newstead. Uh, and this is where we did uh, incorporate intangible costs in, in the analysis. Um, so you can see the, the in potentially impacted buildings there, they're mostly residential. Um, and, and the way that we deal with the, the intangible costs is to actually look at a, a willingness to pay to avoid. So what would a resident pay um, to, to avoid the social disruption of a power outage or traffic delays or, or displacement from their home? Uh, so you can see that the things that uh, were, were included in the analysis there. And this instance, even including uh, those uh, those intangible costs along with all the other typical costs that we, we can uh, more readily calculate. It still didn't look like it was going to be a, a great investment option to um, to extend the, the levy. The, the benefit um, just wouldn't really offset the cost. So that's that's the, the first utilisation project and our second one uh, was with the National Flood Risk Advisory Group or NFRAG. Uh, and was for the development of generalised vulnerability curves. So this was uh, aimed at users who may want to understand uh, flood risk for whatever reason, but they don't have access to the detailed exposure information. So as I've sort of touched on, uh, developing those detailed exposure uh, uh, databases is, is a significant amount of work if you're going building by building and you don't just want to know the, the materials and the roof type and things like that, the number of stories, but you actually want to know the floor height as well. Uh, there was really good stakeholder engagement through this project. So we had, we had three uh, workshops throughout the project and, and got a lot of really valuable feedback from our, our stakeholders. Uh, following the, the second workshop, um, we, we actually rather than using one of the ABS type um, geographical uh, descriptors, we went with land use planning zones um, and you can see those overlaid there on Launceston again. Uh, so these uh, land use planning zones do vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but, but there's enough similarity that they, they can, uh, you can, you can compare uh, the different types. So through this utilisation project, uh, generalised curves were developed for Mwilumba and Tweed Heads in New South Wales and also Launceston. Uh, and since the project formally completed, we, we've also developed those for Wagga Wagga. Where we had enough data, uh, we, did, we did split the set, data sets in half and uh, develop the curves on one half of the data and then test them on the other uh, with quite encouraging uh, results. <clears throat> 
And then we were also testing them against the detailed model outcomes where we'd use that building by building uh, vulnerability attribution, run through the same process um, of the risk analysis and, and then make comparisons at the end. And, and you'd, you'd sort of expect given that we, we're testing uh, data that's been developed on itself that, that the, the outcomes should be good and, and they were. Uh, so they're encouraging results. There's a couple more things that we'd like to, to follow through with on, on the curves. Um, one is to explore the portability. So can you use uh, curves from a one particular community type uh, and see how that compares if you, you transport it to, a, to another location where we might be looking at what we'd call a, a regional centre. So say Tweed Heads uh, and, and see how they work in, in Wagga, for example. Uh, and we'd also like to add a Queensland community. So there's been a, a real New South Wales, uh, Tasmania focus on, on the work to date. Um, but, but one next step might be to, to look at adding a Queensland community, possibly Bundaberg. So on to uh, more recent applications. Um, we use the, the generalized models or, or one suite of them for a, in a flood forecasting, uh, flood, flood impact forecasting proof of concept in St George in Queensland. Uh, that was done in collaboration with the Bureau of Meteorology, uh, the Queensland uh, Fire and Emergency Services, uh, Queensland Department of Transport and Main Roads and uh, a consultant, uh, Deltaris. So the, the workflow there followed the, uh, the hazard exposure vulnerability impact workflow, uh, where the Bureau of Meteorology, they obviously do forecast floods. Uh, they can give us uh, an estimate of what the, the height will be at particular gauge locations along a river. Um, part of the, the work that needed to be done then is, to, is how you actually turn that gauge height into a, a depth at a particular property. Um, and so there, there was a bit of work done there in, in terms of defining uh, the hazard at, at particular exposure locations. We used the generalised models to, to forecast damage and then other impacts. And so that again was, was really promising and highlighted uh, some of the work that would need to be done to, to turn that into a um, more of an operational capability. Other recent applications, uh, and not so much applications, but maybe the provision of advice. So uh, some of that was to the National Recovery and Resilience Agency, and then also to uh, a group of LGAs in Victoria, um, uh, ranging from the eastern, eastern suburbs of Melbourne down to Phillip Island, who are undertaking uh, flood risk uh, analyses and also looking at the, the cost benefit of, of some different uh, mitigation options there. So we, we provided uh, information to them. Actually, and that reminds me that um, I am covering a lot of material here over quite a few years. Um, so most of this actually has been published in different forms. Uh, so a lot of the work is accessible through uh, the GA um, uh, publications portal. So if you, if you can put the, the right search terms in there, hopefully you would, you'd find our work. Um, and also uh, the CRC work is, is quite readily available through their website as well. So all of the reports we've provided to them as well as presentations, um, uh, reporting on the workshops and things like that. So it, it just about it has all been published uh, in, in full. Almost done. Um, so next steps. Uh, one thing that we, we do have a, a real knowledge gap in is, is the use or development of, of business contents loss models. I mentioned earlier that that is a, a tricky thing because um, the, the models can, oh, I mean, the, the contents obviously vary greatly depending on the, the business type uh, and what they, what they stock in, in their business. Uh, we'll, we'll undertake that this year through a, uh, a collaboration with RMIT University. So uh, Tariq Maksud, one of our, our former staff members here at GA is, is working at RMIT now. We're, we're continuing to work with them uh, through a collaboration agreement. I've already touched on that, but uh, we'd like to develop some generalised vulnerability models for a Queensland community. Again, that, that's a bit of a gap in, in that work. Uh, through some of the workshop activity we've had, uh, we, we've identified some real opportunities to, to work with uh, the insurance industry and also the flood risk consulting industry uh, to look at the utility, utility of the models that we've developed 
uh, and also how we may be able to improve them. Um, I've just touched on the proof of concept at, at St George. Um, so we, we'd really like to be able to advance a, a flood impact forecasting capability with the Bureau. Uh, we, we will have work internally to, to meet the needs of the Australian Climate Service, uh, the recently uh, formed ACS. And we're also looking at, at ways that we might be able to advance the work uh, on the avoided cost measures for intangibles uh, and in particular, say, the mental health impacts through the Natural Hazard Research Australia program. So the NHRA is the, uh, the successor now to the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC. So we, we have the potential, hopefully, to, to um, look at some of the research you're doing there and, and how we can use it. Uh, so that's the end. Uh, I don't have a summary slide, but, but I would just like to, again, highlight that this is the um, is the, the basically a, a pretty brief summary, I suppose, of about 18 years of work by a lot of people. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone who's, who's contributed towards it. Uh, it's been a massive effort over a number of years. Uh, the work is continuing. Uh, it's, it's valuable work, we think. So we, we obviously do uh, have continuing impacts of floods. We want to be able to reduce those impacts on uh, properties and, and people uh, wherever we can. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to just say thank you for joining in. Um, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Ken. That was a great talk and I, I do like your last slide there. That um, looks like an extreme kind of mitigation for flood um, option there. So and a huge amount of work that's been done over the last, you said, 18 years. So fantastic to hear about it and also how the, the work has actually um, impacted, I guess, how we can mitigate against floods. There are a few questions I note in the chat, so I'll start at the bottom. So uh, Nick Cook, I'll uh, we'll combine your uh, question there. Um, why are people surprised when, when floodplains get flooded? So that's a, a, <laughs> an interesting question. <laughs> that is a good question. I won't go into the issue of development on floodplains because I'm a, a simple structural engineer and that is not my position. But um, uh, some people uh, may move to a, a location. Um, they might buy a property and not be aware at all that it's that it is flood prone. Um, so that is that is part of, I guess, education that is probably the, the local government uh, responsibility. And and some people. Uh, or governments do that where they have flood markers and things like that to try and, and give um, people uh, some advice on, on what may have happened in the past. We also tend to have relatively short memories. So, you know, um, again, people people just might might forget how bad it was. Although if, if they've lived through a bad flood, they probably won't. Um, but it, it might be more to do with that, that mobility throughout um, society. So when people move to a different location, they're just not aware of what may have happened there in the past. Thanks. Uh, Kaya Wilson's asked, why did you assume the levees weren't there? I think that was the initial kind of your um, start of your Tassie kind of uh, uh, project there. Uh, it was because we already had a really, really good data set there. And if the levees were there, we wouldn't have actually had that need for any of the other mitigation measures. So it was, it was basically looking at, at the impact of those levies uh, and and when we we're looking at the the community response or the the aggregated building response uh, it, it just if, if the levies had been in place we wouldn't have had those benefits of those other mitigation types so I hope that answers the question Kaya. No worries the next question is from Christian Cumberland. Do you also consider salinity as a variable in your depth damage calculations or does it not matter whether the flood water is fresh or salty? Uh, we don't consider that. What we typically assume is that the flood water is really, really dirty. Um, so there can be all sorts of um, all sorts of biological and other materials in there. So, so probably that's more of an issue than uh, the water being saline or not. Uh, but the short answer is no, we're just assuming everything gets wet and, and has to be cleaned because um, there'll be some 
really horrible stuff. And you could see that hopefully in those couple of images where we had the interior views of flooded properties where they're just full of um, dirt, silt and all sorts of other things. Mm. Yep. No worries. Um, Felicity has also asked a question here. Um, one of the main problems we face is the constructions of residential houses and dike areas that have to accommodate water during the rainy season. How should we think about optimising water resources during the flood season for an, a season, an area with a dry season? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and I'm not sure I have a, a really good answer for that one. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I guess you, you should, ideally you wouldn't be developing in a flood prone uh, location, but, but that doesn't uh, help properties are already there. So I guess we that's a slightly separate issue where we're really looking at, at what you might be able to do to, to mitigate a, a property that is already located in a flood prone location. Um, and we, we've really just looked at those options rather than uh, whether you should develop there or not. And, and also not uh, that, that issue of, of, of drought versus uh, a wet season. So I'm sorry, that's probably not a real good answer. Okay, we've got a nice uh, long question from Phil, Phil Cummins. After the 2021 New South Wales floods, it was commented in the media that unbelievably the government is still planning to build something like 100,000 homes in the floodplain. Are governments required to do the kind of cost benefit analysis you described before making such planning decisions? If, as the evidence suggests, not how close are we to requiring this? How close are we requiring this? Are we at least moving in this direction? So it's getting into the policy world. Yes, and I'm going to try and stay out of that if that's okay. I'm sorry, Phil. Um, as I mentioned earlier, ideally you wouldn't be developing in a floodplain or if you were, you would be um, trying to have the appropriate regulations for your your buildings uh, to, to try and um, yes, mitigate any any future flooding effects on them. But um, I'm, I'm not going to get into the policy part of that, if, if that's okay. Sorry, yeah. Phil. Yeah, that certainly um, it go, comes down to kind of individual councils and planning and, and yes, that one's a, a bit of a tricky one to, to actually respond to, I think. Uh, lots of good comments there and a great presentation. Uh, another question here uh, from Edward. Uh, recently, Europe and America have had mud flow events. What impact can it ha what impact can it happen in Australia? Uh, well, it would it would have a huge impact. So, um, uh, are you talking about landslide or, or this? This one's just it says flood flow events so and i've seen some horrific photos of some oh of those yeah yeah yep yeah. um so yes the same thing can happen in australia we, we have had um impacts like that in the past so uh dungog obviously was a, a quite a localized uh relatively small community but there was uh serious impacts there and and some fatalities there um during the flooding um so yeah we, we uh um i i Took the uh, national focus, I guess, when I was doing my presentation, and I had the images from New South Wales and uh, uh, Gippsland. But yeah, more recently, there's also been the, the horrible floods in in Europe, and um, now the the post uh, hurricane flooding is is continuing in the US. Excellent, and there's a a comment here from Neil. Excellent presentation, Ken. Thank you. Have GA and or others done much work in terms of projected projected heavy associated with projected climate change related to hazards including SLR, urban heat, bushfire, etc. We have recently done some probabilistic hazard analysis and damage assessments followed by a CBA in and around Swansea Channel, Lake Macquarie, New South Wales. Uh, so uh, we do not get involved in uh, bushfire hazard, as far as I know. Um, a lot of our, a lot of the flood work, for example, is is really being done in, in present climate. But obviously, we would we would like to start looking at potential future climate impacts there. Uh, 
One option we may have is, is to revisit the lawn system work. So they have had uh, revised uh, hazard modelling done there, uh, incorporating uh, climate change, uh, potential climate change impacts into that. Um, I would also defer, I'm not sure if Craig's online, but uh, Craig Arthur, our um, meteorological man, who has developed our tropical cyclone uh, risk model, um, might be able to comment on, on whether we're incorporating future climate into that yet or not. Um, I'll also quickly say, because I know we're getting short on time, that the chat, uh, I think, has all been recorded. So if, if there's any questions that I don't get to here, um, I'd be happy to follow up with them um, afterwards. Thanks, Ken. And also Deborah, which also may come into a Craig's space. Um, her question is about, are you considering further environmental parameters such as the impact of wind strength, potential cyclone strength on elevated buildings, is, is this a factor? Possibly in cyclone conditions, it doesn't matter if a building is low rather than high off the ground. So I think that might be a combination of yourself and Craig responding to that one. Yeah, and one other thing I didn't mention is that there is the potential, and this, this house on, on screen at the moment is a, a classic example, where uh, you could potentially take a, a mitigation option against flood that actually makes your house more vulnerable to something else like an earthquake, for example, where you've got uh, a relatively heavy box on some spindly legs. Um, I know this isn't an earthquake topic, but we are Geoscience Australia, um, where that, that house is probably uh, fairly vulnerable, I would say, to, um, to earthquake shaking at the moment, unless it's braced. And I, I can't really see much bracing in the... Uh, uh, material there. It certainly doesn't, um, yeah, looks pretty um, fragile to be honest. <laughs> Look, I think that's all the questions unless someone else is going to pop a question in there, but that's, um, you've got lots of great positive um, feedback on your presentation there, Ken, it's great talk. Um, and there's nothing come up, so I'll thanks for your presentation and for those attending, I'll just like to remind people uh, of next week's uh, seminar, which will is is titled "The Power of Where: The Value of Geodesy to the Society," and it's going to be presented by um, Alison Rose, the Chief of uh, Place, Space, and Community Division here at Geoscience Australia, and Nick Brown, so the Director of National Geodesy. Every day, humanity benefits from geodesy. It is the science of measuring the, the size, shape, and orientation and gravity field of our planet. And it is a foundation for evidence-based policy decisions and program delivery. So again, that seminar will be online only. So um, hope to see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for attending and great talk again, Ken. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>